Well, I just want to say hi and welcome to everybody who's joining us. Um, and I'll say a couple of words about how great it is to have Rohini join us. I'm going to have you introduce yourself, Rohini. You'll do a much better job than I'll do. And it'll be wonderful for me to hear what you're up to also. But um, so every six weeks, I bring on another three principles practitioner. And it's a way to expose people in mystery school and beyond mystery school, because these interviews are open to the public. And I'll just say a couple of words how Mystery School came about. We're coming up on almost a year now. It, a year goes so fast. And it all began as a group session when I, before COVID, when I was in an office and I had a conference, the use of a conference room right across the hallway, and we would gather in person and talk about what we're seeing in uh, listening to Sid Banks, reading his books, and then I took it online during COVID. And then I realized, well, now that we're online, I could invite people in the far reaches of, of the world. So in so many ways, um, that misfortune in the world has opened up a lot in other areas. So um, yeah, when we get together now, I offer two different uh, times uh, during the week, every week that we can get together on a Zoom call like this and talk about the insights we've had. And there's this springboard that occurs that's just so beautiful that one person will have an insight and it kind of brings out insights from other people. And, um, you know, on this particular call, we've got some people who were in the early days of Sid. And, you know, they say that it's so much like the, the groups that they had done in the early days. So I just love being, part of this. And um, yeah, so Rohini, if you would introduce yourself, I know you're in California, Southern California, and anything that you can say about the ways in which Sid's teachings have informed your personal life and your professional life. So I know you're another practitioner out in the world doing wonderful things. Hmm. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me, Lori. I'm really grateful to be here. And I'm really looking forward to spending time with everyone here. And I love that it sounds like it's a very interactive, exploratory conversation. So I really value everyone's input and insights. And my eyes and ears and heart are open just as much as I'm here to be of service and share. Um, so in terms of the, your question, Lori, I'm thinking like, well, where do I start? Um, but I mean, my life has been profoundly impacted by the teachings of Sidney Banks, even though I never got to meet him. I, I, I don't know that I've ever met an enlightened man, but I definitely um, feel the impact of his teachings, even without his physical presence. And um, it was one of those journeys where I wasn't really looking to find something new um, in terms of a new orientation, a new way of working with people, but life shows up in a way where I just follow the breadcrumbs. And uh, where I was sort of initially impacted, uh, I'd read the Relationship Handbook um, by George Pransky, and I was definitely impacted by that. And that was, um, gosh, maybe back in 2004, but I didn't understand it was part of a bigger understanding. Like the, the book was helpful and it actually is very instrumental in Angus and I being together now still. But um, it wasn't until much later that I realized that it was part of a, a deeper understanding that was spiritually based. And so after um, I participated in Michael Neal's Supercoach Academy, I learned this and I met George and Linda Pransky and I, I learned more about um, what was behind the content in that book. And I was just really drawn in. And I think one of the first things that drew me in was that I felt a sense of peace when I was listening to them that I didn't usually feel when I was listening to people. And it really struck me that I was able to drop into that space inside of myself just by listening. 
And my intellect didn't have anything to hang on to, to explain how that happened, what they said that impacted me in that way. There was nothing for my intellect to grab onto. But I knew that it was important. I knew that it was different. And I knew that I wanted to experience more of that. And so that's what led me to, you know, looking more deeply into this. And I would say that, you know, when you say, how did it impact me personally, when I um, did an intensive and, you know, I went into the intensive, not really understanding, you know, what an intensive is all about. And I was still kind of in the old psychological self-help model of, I'm going to come with my issues and I'm going to be given something then it's going to help me get rid of my issues because I was still thinking at that time that what I was supposed to be doing was improving myself and um, improving my psychology so that I could have a better experience. I was very focused on what my experience was and it was important to me to have a good experience. If I wasn't having a good experience and I put that down to some lack on my part, some flaw within myself. And I thought, well, if I can just fix all of these flaws, then I'll have much nicer experiences. But underneath it all was really just a, a, a longing to feel worthy and good enough. And that I somehow connected my experience with my self-worth. And that if I was low or um, you know, not feeling good, feeling reactive, that in my mind somehow meant something about who I am. So I hadn't, I didn't understand at that point that those were two completely separate things and that one could not change the other. But in that intensive, I heard something that interrupted that in a really profound way. And what I heard, and I'm gonna share what I heard, but as we all know, it's not really the content of what I heard that's important, but the, the content of what I heard was around um, me trying to fix my humanness wasn't needed, that I was normal and that everybody has insecurities and struggles with their ups and downs and that I didn't need to spend so much or any time or energy trying to fix something because that was an, an indicator of anything being broken and that I could just relax and enjoy my experience, whatever it is. And, and when I heard that, I really heard that I was, I was good enough, but not in a way where the ego is like, oh, now I'm good enough. Now I'm, you know, this or that. It was, it sort of took the question out of the equation and it no longer became a relevant question to look at my worth. It was no longer anything that was really important or something that I needed to focus on. And it freed me up so much. And, and um, you know, we probably all had experience in our, in our lives where we just get impacted by feeling really deeply impacted. And that was one of those moments where I was deeply impacted by a beautiful feeling of peace and calm in a way that, um, in a depth that I hadn't experienced previously. And um, I didn't stay in that same feeling forever, but it was the taste it was enough to let me know the direction to keep looking in. And, and in that space, I just realized that that feeling is what's important. And it wasn't a feeling associated with the psychology that you know feelings come and go. It was a different kind of experience of a feeling. And I recognized that that that's the constant, even though I don't experience it constantly, that that is the constant. And, and it was so reassuring. It was so comforting. Um, I have a funny story. I, um, I felt so exhilarated. And after I left the intensive, I was driving to the place that I was staying at. And I was just um, really just high. 
And so I'm driving out of the little town, it's in the Connor. And I knew the, the speed limit is 25 miles an hour in the town. And then when you leave the town, it goes up to something like 40. And so when I left the town, I'm like, <laughs> I just like went up to 40 very quickly. And then all of a sudden I see these sirens behind me. <laughs> and the, I'd never had a speeding ticket in my life. <laughs> And I got pulled over by this uh, officer and I hadn't left the town limits. I thought I was out of the town, but it was still 25 miles an hour. And so I called Angus that night. I said, Angus, I got a speeding ticket. And he said, oh my goodness, how fast are you going? And I said, 40 miles an hour. And he just laughed. He's like, really? <laughs> that's what your ticket's for? But anyway, that's just a little side. But that was just a reflection of the freedom and the liberation that I was feeling in that moment. And you know, I knew that that was my compass point. Um, I knew that that was uh, just a feeling that was not just a, a feeling. It was an, there's an intelligence in that. And so after that experience, I realized that so much of my time and energy personally had been going into the direction of self-improvement, which could just come off the table, which was very freeing and liberating. And then I realized that the orientation of my work, because at that point as a licensed therapist and I was um, starting to do coaching work in uh, companies and uh, with individuals looking in the direction of that kind of work. And I realized that in that work, I was also looking to improve psychology as a way to have a deeper experience of, um, you know, help people have a deep, deeper experience of who they were. And I could see at that point that it was misguided because I was thinking that you needed to improve the psychology in order to have a deeper spiritual understanding. And I couldn't do that anymore because I could see that one was in a completely different direction, looking in a completely different direction than the other, and that I could just point people to the truth of who they are without having to um, do the psychological work that I had been doing. And that didn't mean that psychology wouldn't transform and heal and that feelings wouldn't come up. Because when I, when I was really impacted, the first thing I wanted to do was cry. Like I just had so much um, emotion come forward within me, tears of relief. And then it was really funny because I was very self-conscious about crying because I was like, I don't even really know this person that I'm sitting with. I'm like having this huge inner experience and like, I just want the tears to come out. And so there's still a certain amount of psychological self-consciousness going on, but none of that really mattered because what was shifting and moving inside of me was, you know, didn't really care about that. And so that really shifted the orientation of my work and, um, you know, it just kept going from there. And I, and I saw the difference in the, the way that I felt when I was working with people. I think one of the things that I was struggling with, not only um, my sort of anxiety and self-consciousness at that time, but I was al also struggling with some feelings of burnout. And when I started working with people looking in the direction of that feeling of who they are, and, and, you know, co-creating that together and listening to their wisdom and pointing them to the answers that they have inside of themselves and really knowing that I didn't know anything that would be valuable for them, that all I could do is point them to what they have already inside of themselves and that they are the only ones that can have access to that and to know that and that nobody can give that to them. I mean, I think that just took a whole, a huge weight off my shoulders as well. And so my experience of working became very different and I felt much lighter in general. And then, um, you know, one of the things that I've talked about a lot is the impact of that inner lightness and inner experience of safety within myself, how that transformed my relationship with Angus. And we had been married for, um, gosh, I don't know, a long time, <laughs> probably 15 years, maybe more. I can't do the math right now. I'm in too much of the feeling to do any math, but we've been married for quite a while. And we had 
overcome, like, I would say the most difficult, challenging part of our relationship with the help of the relationship handbook. But there was still a certain amount of resignation that I was experiencing about our relationship that, you know, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to leave him, but, um, you know, I'm just going to make do in a sense. It's good enough. It's a good enough relationship. And of course, that's not a beautiful feeling. <laughs> and it's still got a lot of judgment and criticism within myself toward him in that kind of point of view. And when I dropped deeper into that knowing of who I am, just that taste of it, and felt the inner safety of that, felt my okayness in that, it really shifted how I saw Angus. And it lifted the judgments that I had towards him, you know, his frailties around his temper, around, you know, whatever things that I would have judgments around, it lifted that for me so that I could love him as he is. And I didn't realize how much I had been suffering, not loving him as he is. I didn't realize that I was the one paying the price for not having that open heart. And I wasn't doing it on purpose. I couldn't have done any better, but feeling the difference, I realized what I had been, been missing out on. And so what happened was in that shift within myself, Angus didn't know anything about the understanding at that point. He didn't want to know anything about the understanding at that point because I had traumatized him by dragging him to every single thing I got involved in over the years. And he's like, mm -mm, I'm done. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this one by myself. But he saw such a shift in me and he felt the shift in me. He felt the different way that I was loving him and open to him. And that got him really curious. And the other thing that he said to me is that when I wasn't in that critical space with him, that he actually felt his own conscience more and that our old dynamic where, you know, he might've, um, you know, behaved in a way that was angry and then I would have reacted to it or responded to it either with hurt or my own anger, like that dance that we had been doing for years and years and years, when that stopped, he could see how he was behaving and he didn't like it. So I didn't need to ask him to change. He didn't like how he was behaving and he saw the possibility of something new for himself. So without him having to do anything, just the ripple effect in our relationship really started that transformation. And then as many of you know, he then got involved in the understanding and uh, we both work together now and uh, he has his own practice, but we also do a lot of work with couples. And we really love working with couples based on what we've experienced. It's a real gift to be able to help others get freed up from the pain and suffering that they might be experiencing in their relationships. And so um, that is something that I never in a million years would have predicted that we were working together. In fact, I would, it would have been an emphatic no, that will never happen. Um, not because I don't love Angus and appreciate him, but I just never thought that that would be something that he would be interested in doing. And so this is just an example of how, when we step into the unknown, possibilities reveal themselves to us. And I didn't plan that. It just evolved very kind of organically. I think probably the first start of that was when I, I said to him, I think we should do some blogs together because I think it will help other couples. I think that um, us sharing about our experiences might be beneficial to other people to normalize what they go through. And there's a lot of misunderstandings about relationship. And um, for whatever reason, he said yes, even though his, his, his uh, psychology was pretty resistant, um, he still said yes. And so that was probably the start of us working together in a very informal way. And then it's just progressed from there. And now we, uh, we love the metaphor of rewilding, um, which is a term that's 
used for nature and how nature can be rewilded back to its natural state when it's given the right conditions to do so. And, and we love using that metaphor to describe how we can be rewilded by our true nature and that it doesn't matter what our conditioning is or what we've taken on board or what has happened to us in our lives, that we all have that capacity to be rewilded back to our natural state of love. And, um, and so we're having a lot of fun with that in the work that we do now. And, um, you know, it's just an ongoing journey. So I'm looking at the time. I know I've spoken a lot and I do want to allow there to be time for group sharing. So Lori, I'm going to just turn it back to you and, and let you take the lead. No, it was great hearing about all of that. You know, I haven't seen you in person in many years now. And the last time was at a conference in the UK. So that was four years ago now, I think. So this is so much fun, you know, and what's amazing to me and I want to open it up for other questions but I'm just going to say a bit about how since you know I've been working with couples also and um, it's just so amazing to me the difference when people recognize that it's not happening out there it's not their partner that's making them feel miserable it's their expectations of their partner. It's their, like you said, judgments and criticisms. So it's all happening within the individual. Yeah, it's just such a, the opposite of, certainly my graduate training, and it sounded like yours as well, that it's literally coming from the opposite direction of not changing what's out there, but seeing something which automatically changes what's happening inside of us. And it's wild to explain, like, well, how do you explain seeing something? You said would put it all in capital letters, seeing. And then when you see something, you realize that's what he meant, right? I mean, I just love how that mm -hmm. works. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so clear that the relationship is a byproduct of the states of mind of the participants in the relationship. And that since it's a byproduct, there isn't really work on the relationship. There's simply um, looking in the direction of state of mind and the quality of that, of the individuals in the relationship. And that like with Angus and myself, even just one person having a shift within themselves related to their experience of well-being their knowing of their own inner love and safety security that that's enough oftentimes to create significant change in in the quality of that relationship just by one person making that shift and obviously when two people make that shift it's it's beautiful but it's it's contagious and it's i think we all want to be in that deeper feeling we all know it in some way and just get confused about what really allows us to experience it consciously. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, so I'd love to hear from people who are with us. What kind any questions, comments, things that you have seen that have made a difference for you? There's a, a hand you can raise, by the way, on the bottom. Um, yeah, I think it's where the reactions. Yes, is a, no. <laughs> I need my glasses for this, I forget. Where. Yeah, it is under reactions. Raise so hand. Like, yeah, there it is. There's a raise hand. I should be confused by the clap. There's also clapping hands, it's funny. <laughs> Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, Alan's got his hand raised. Alan, Alan's got. Oh his. gosh, that was so sweet, Rohini. Mm -hmm. I mean, no kidding. That was that was so sweet. And um, what I've um, I think what I've discovered is very practical is that if I can find that feeling 
from safety and openness. You know, uh, my uh, relationship with Nancy is oh so much better. <laughs> it's oh so much better. And I was thinking about it. So I've been in a strategic planning meeting for the last two days at the health center I work with. And uh, if, I can, if I can find that feeling in a strategic planning meeting, um, I notice that, that what comes to me, new information, uh, feeling of caring, uh, it serves me there too. And um, I, I guess that's, that's what I, I, I heard when you were speaking as I heard the, the power of that feeling. And, uh, I would agree. It's, it's down to earth, practical. Down, it's so rubber meets the road, practical, and it's lost so easy. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Alan. And I love that you're pointing out how it just shows up everywhere in terms of being able to have those new ideas come in, like you're saying, whether it's a strategic planning meeting, whether it's a conversation with your teenager or whoever. It's like when we're in that open hearted feeling space, we co create something that's very different than when we're not. so simple you know it's the simplicity that um is so really astonishing yeah i'm working with um someone who's uh, uh a yoga teacher and so they've um you know from they were raised in the community so from you know a young age as a child they've been taught all of these um yogic techniques and practices to use if their if their mood drops or if they're having uncomfortable feelings and so i had to say like you know if we're working together i'm going to be pointing you in a completely different direction are you okay with that and um and she said she was and that was what stood out to her lawyer is just the simplicity that even though all of those yogic techniques were designed to get to the place that we're talking about she's seeing that there's a simplicity of simply opening up to what is and allowing the human experience to be what it is as a way to open up to that rather than trying to manage or control it and <clears throat> change it that we can simply be with it and it's in the being with it that actually allows us to drop into that feeling more which can feel very paradoxical if we're struggling with anger or whatever that might be but it's that freedom and that spaciousness to be with all of ourselves on the psychological level that I've seen to be the doorway to a deeper knowing of what's beyond that yeah and, and it feels like a miracle too it's so simple but also miraculous mm -hmm. that yeah getting out of our own way. Sid had a wonderful uh, phrase about what you were speaking to, which was um, look at what is, not at what isn't, hmm. right? I mean, when we're in judgment and expectation and um, that's a, what isn't. <laughs> what is is right, what's happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. Kind of judgment about it yeah Be free and clear yeah. you tapping into that universal wisdom that will just direct us yeah Perfect. and you know while we're <clears throat> waiting for whoever else would like to share because i definitely would love to hear from people uh, when when you're saying that laura it's making me think of also how with all of my emphasis on self-improvement I had um, really created this, a lot of rules and expectations for myself about how I was allowed to show up in the world, what was good about me, what was bad about me, 
what was shameful, what couldn't be revealed, and um, sort of having that recognition that it's okay to be with what is, like that quote you're saying, Lord, to just be with what is, that there was definitely a learning curve around, and still is a learning curve for me around being really with <clears throat> the fullness of my human experience that includes the full range of emotions and being able to navigate what that is in terms of having room for all of that and showing up in life. And I know one of the things that really surprised me and it might not sound like it's growth, but hopefully I'll be able to explain it in a way where I can actually see that it's growth. But I had so many expectations on how to be, uh, how I had to show up as a mom. And, you know, my intention was and still is to be a loving mother and to show up from that place. But that wasn't always my internal experience. And so what I learned to do was just not show what was really going on for me and try and present in a certain way for my kids and in life in general, not just my kids, but, um, and they could feel the inauthenticity in that. And they didn't like that, but I didn't really know much better than that. And then Angus, is much more, um, you know, wears his heart on his sleeve, is much more kind of free flowing in terms of how he is with his emotional experience. And I really judge that. And so talk about eating humble pie. So I come across this understanding when my kids are, I think 13 and 15. So just as they're entering the teenage years. And there's one day where our, I think she was 15, maybe 16 year old at the time, she was, you know, letting me have it in a pretty intense way. And normally I would have been able to just like, you know, batten down the hat. It wouldn't have been authentic, but I would just been like stealing myself inside and, and I didn't, I could, I just, I just said what came to mind. And I was so shocked and it was a really transformative experience. Not that I want to lose my temper with my children. That's not the point that I'm making, but in me no longer having this sort of constant self-management going on, there was actually an interaction that happened between us that we had to work through, but it actually helped us get closer when we were able to work it through. And that she was, you know, we talk about how experience comes from inside of us. And absolutely my anger was not a result of what she was doing to me, but it was a result of me getting caught up and identifying with painful thinking within myself. But I have a bandwidth and I have a limit, which I hadn't been willing to be honest about with them. And I could have definitely, and this is part of my learning is walk away sooner so that I don't do that. And I don't think I've done that in a very long time, but it was part of the learning curve for me to let go of the self-judgment around all of my experience and to be with my humanity and to recognize that it's, it is messy as a learning curve and it's not always gonna look the way that we want it to look or that it should look, but that it's much better as far as I'm concerned to be able to um, live in the messiness of that and be learning from that rather than to be trying to, to live a false self really and present that. And, and I wouldn't have thought it was gonna look that way, right? If you said, oh, what's it gonna look like when you have more understanding of who you are? I didn't think it would be like, oh, and yeah, you're gonna lose your temper more with your kids. Like, I didn't think that was how it was gonna look, but that was part of the learning curve. And I think it's important for people to recognize that we don't know how it's gonna look, what, what's gonna emerge. You know, I don't know, maybe Angus and I have a wonderful relationship. Maybe that might not have been how it would have gone, who knows? But to, to be with the, the flow and to be able to step into the unknown and to see what life is teaching us and to kind of accept the way that life is teaching us and to work with it, like you're saying, Lori, to be with what is and to allow what is 
to be experienced without the judgments or even with the judgments, but knowing they're the judgments. It's like that has been um, just an ongoing sort of waking up to that and and grappling with this human experience that's an expression of this divine essence and how that all fits together and how that has nothing to do with all of the conditioning that I've put over it all of these years and to just feel the peeling away of that and the freedom of that and and knowing that that's that's available for all of us and that that conditioning can feel so real and strong but yet it's it's you know it's not even real like that's how how nothing it is it's not even real but yet the experience of it can feel so strong so i just thought i would share that because it came to mind when you said you know be with what is and sometimes it's like this is what is okay i'll be with this <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's part of being a humble human. <laughs> we all get caught up. And you reminded me of an old phrase in the old psychology, and it's probably still used in places. Fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sid, yeah. you picture Sid Banks ever saying something like that? Never in a million years, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. But there was this conditioned belief that if we... Uh, pretend to be mm -hmm. something that eventually will turn into that something. I mean, that's how really off base <laughs> or going in the opposite direction of where yeah. you'd want to go. You, you know, you, the we're, innocence of that. People are drawn to the three principles and the teachings of Sid because their spirit is drawn to that. It resonates. They really, you know, back when I heard fake it till you make it, like back in the 80s, probably, because yeah. I started to be drawn into this uh, teaching of Sid and, and the three principles in 1985. So it had to be pre-1985. And I knew that that sounded, I, I couldn't even relate to that. But it's so easy to relate to what I what I hear from Sid. Now, you know, I, I didn't know what he was talking about when I first started mm -hmm. listening to him. I just had that feeling like you explained, Rohini. It was very similar to that of such relief, but not relief that I didn't have to work on myself because I don't think I was working so <laughs> Oh, you were much further ahead than I was. <laughs> I think there was anything that needed fixing. I don't know. But I was working on everybody else. I was trying to, <laughs> get to change the way I wanted them. And then I heard my first talk of sense. It was like, holy cow. I, it's not up to me to control everything. I, I, you know, I have no idea what I could have been thinking to all of a sudden wake up to the fact that life happens it's i'm not at the in the driver's seat here what a relief that was yeah oh, wow. yeah i hear you yeah so who else is going to share alan do you still have your hand raised or is yeah yeah, yeah this, this just occurred to me one of the issues over the decades right the decades has always been how to be real for people that have real problems and real issues and real challenges you know how to be real and one of the ways that has helped me is to uh, sometimes principles is uh, a little bit intellectual for people so for me the way I, the way i've come to think about it is that i was when i was born i was given three gifts and i can use these three gifts to make my life really any any way i want it and if I'm suffering, then, you know, guess what, Alan? You know, I'm using those three gifts to suffer. And if I'm using those three gifts to be open, then, you know, that's that's the way I'm using them, too. But it, I, I, I like the idea of, of these, uh, the principles being 
gifts. Hmm. All right, just a thought. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Alan. They sure are. I mean, we wouldn't have an experience of life without them. What a gift. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to think of them. Yeah. Let's see, there's a question. Here we go. Thank you so much. I'm putting my children to sleep so can share. <laughs> oh, so it's late wherever Sarah is. Really enjoying listening. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you listen to me? Yeah. And Rohini yeah, is currently about to start with her training. So maybe she can talk about that. Yeah. Sure. I'm happy to speak about that. Um, yeah. So last year, um, I just really got inspired to uh, look at being able to support practitioners who want to share the understanding and to really look at how to um, support that being a diverse group of participants. And so we did our first um, rewilder guide training that Azul was a part of. It was wonderful having you Azul. And um, it's really, uh, you know, an opportunity for people to uh, be in an immersive program that really allows them to have support as they're wanting to be of service more in the world and share from this from the understanding that Sid Banks um, pointed to. And uh, so it's it's you know I don't really know what to say about it other than <clears throat> it's a, a deep dive into that deeper experience of true nature and love and having that be the feeling that guides the process of pointing others in the direction of who they are and for people to have support in doing that one of the biggest things um, that comes my way in terms of what people want support with is they have difficulty um, stepping out and being seen and they have a lot of self-consciousness, a lot of self-judgments. And so I, I really love how the group environment is so nurturing. And I was completely blown away by the level of love and care and generosity that was demonstrated with all of the participants last year. And, and to me, that really speaks to what happens when we come together and drop into that feeling and what emerges from that. And it's certainly not about me or about Angus, it's about what gets created in that space. And so I'm really looking forward to that. And then the next one is starting in uh, October 8th. And one of the things um, that we, Angus and I are doing as part of our service is that the acceptance into that program is um, independent of financial capacity to pay the full fee. And we really look at making um, the program available to anyone who wants to participate because they have that calling in their heart. And so we do our best to make sure that there are no financial barriers to that. And the link for the program is in the chat. Oh, and thank it, you. Yeah, and it's so interesting that uh, several people have come forward who were interested in mystery school. They're in mystery school because they're interested in being a group talking about Sid, and now they're turned on to bringing it into other yeah. groups, pairing it with other yeah. people. So it's perfect that they can then go to your program and become more involved in uh, the practice and, and sharing with other within other groups. Yeah, I think that's just very a very natural extension once we're impacted we tend to want to help other people be impacted because it's like wow you know i don't want to keep this to myself yeah yeah it's true yeah so any last questions we've got another i don't know 10 minutes right what else do you want to talk about i i'm curious like what um so you came to Sid through Michael Neal. Is that how it went? I always loved yeah. 
Well, it was it was interesting. I did Super Coach Academy um, before it was a three principles training, but George and Linda were there for one weekend, and so that was how I that was you know part of my journey. Um, and like I said, I'd read the book that George wrote before that, and then I got to meet them. Oh, Angus is coming in. <laughs> Sorry for that interruption. <laughs> he changed direction. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> he's obviously forgot his car key or something oh, right if he's so high. yeah all right he's gone already <laughs> but um yeah so that was that was sort of the entry point for me is there do you have like a favorite book or favorite recording of Sid's that I think that probably my favorite book of Sid's is Second Chance yeah why do you say that, that one I just, um, the feeling that that evokes within me, it's, and I also, I love Hawaii, but um, there's, I think it's just the feeling that evokes in me, the feeling of hope and possibility. And it's not that his other books don't have that within them, but for whatever reason, that one really speaks to me. And, and um, I just think it's so beautiful and touching. Do you know Rohini? And this is very humbling. <laughs> when I first read that in 1985, it went totally over my head. I mm. thought, well, this is an interesting story. It's so far-fetched and it's so, um, I don't know what I was thinking. I, it just did not register. It was only after I heard several of Sid's talks that I went back to read his books. And then I read Second Chance, and it was like a really different book. <laughs> yeah. I saw yeah. so many gems in there. And I it's so interesting how you open a doorway to see a little bit, and then you see more and more and more. It's so interesting how that happens. Yeah, we seem to just get what we need what we're ready for in that moment i'm sure i could go back and read it again now even though i've read it m many times to get yeah. even more out of it and see something new and different and yeah that is hopeful too to recognize that yeah in fact i'm reading it now again because it's we're in a new group and i always recommend that people can start anywhere with sit but i recommend start with this first book second chance mm -hmm. And so I'm reading it again now, and um, I'm thinking, boy, I want to be in Hawaii. I want to go to the Pioneer Inn. Is there such? A <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. It just evokes so much of that, and Hawaii seems to have such a beautiful energy in that space. So it all comes together. Yeah. Oh, the one other thing I'd love to mention, if people are interested, um, is Angus is my podcast, Rewilding Love. We had a lot of fun uh, putting that together. And the first, the first, I don't know, maybe uh, 15 episodes of it are a recording of an intensive that we did with a couple. And we took excerpts from that intensive and then added our commentary to it. But we've had really lovely feedback about how that um, has been beneficial for people to listen to. And that was our hope is that we could create something that would share the understanding in a way that people would find interesting, but that would also be really helpful to them since we can you know, only work with a certain number of people ourselves to create something that could reach a, a wider audience. Um, I thought that would be good to mention as well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. And so how do people find the podcast? Oh, it's called Rewilding Love and probably just Google Rewilding Love. It's on Apple and you know, all of the places podcasts are found. And it's a great catchy title, Rewilding. Mm. Um, yeah. Wonderful. So let's see, somebody posted Rewilding. Oh, so the podcast, there's a link in the chat box. Thanks as well. Mm, thank you. Wonderful. So we got time for another question. Somebody just said something. Everybody's muted. I've got a question. I got a question. <laughs> ah, go. So in a in a nutshell, what's the most important thing to know 
about relationships. Mm. That your natural state is love. And that we can all come back to our natural state. And that as we feel our natural state, then the relationship will reflect that. That question made me nervous, Alan. I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> we have to say it in a nutshell. It's like, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> you know, it's so funny, Rohini, that couples will come to me and they'll say that they have to fix their relationship, right? That's the general thinking that they yeah. have to communicate better. And yeah. Point is getting into a state of mind where they hear each other better. Yeah. And yeah. then communication is is free, flowing. It just flows. Yeah, yeah it, it, you're right, Lori. It is a very, it's like a 180 direction to look in rather than looking at the relationship. And, and as you're saying earlier, typically people look at the problems in the relationship and then they make conclusions based on what they see there rather than looking at their own experience within themselves and seeing how to take care of themselves like people don't realize how they're um you know using the gifts as alan is saying to create suffering within themselves and it's innocent but when we start to see that one-to-one -one relationship between our thoughts and our feelings then we know the direction to look in when we're suffering is how do i take care of myself as i go through this experience What's going to allow me to settle my mind so that I can come back home within myself? What's that self-care look like? And it doesn't look like self-improvement. It doesn't look like working on ourselves. You know, people will often, I, numerous people have said to me, well, binging on Netflix can't be self-care. I'm like, why not? <laughs> you know, if it's settling your mind, why is that not self-care? And people have this um, misunderstanding about what self-care looks like. It's like you have to go against what that inner inclination is asking for and somehow do something noble. I'm like, why not just listen to, to what feels good for you and what you're um, drawn to and to know that whatever that is, is your best understanding in that moment. And it might change. Like maybe it won't be Netflix another day. Maybe it will be something else. But, but can we trust ourselves and can we trust that intelligence within us to be our guide that is not the intellect, which is full of ideas and full of conditioning, but to really trust the feeling that speaks to us, that we all have in equal amounts, that nobody is missing, and can we learn to respect and trust that and let that be the compass in our life? And we're not told to do that. We're told to listen to our intellect, whether it's in our families, whether it's in our culture, whether it's in our schooling system. But the message that has been known by many traditions, indigenous cultures, spiritual traditions, Sydney Banks teachings, is to <clears throat> listen to that knowing that has a feeling on it that is of love, of peace, of well being. And it might not tell us more than the next step, but we'll get that. And then more will be revealed. Absolutely. I love that taking care of yourself rather than looking to your partner to take care of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. The X, Y, Z, A, B, C, she has to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C for me to be happy. And that is not true. That's <laughs> absolutely not true. Yeah. What is true is looking for a beautiful feeling inside ourselves, inside yeah. each yeah. one. And then that changes, that ripples out, that nice feeling ripples out and changes other people. Yeah. Wonderful. So I love that heart. <laughs> the soul's got a heart. Yeah. Oh, this has been so great. I'm so, so happy that you're able to join us for this hour. Mm -hmm. And um, look forward to hearing how everything is going with you in the future. And thanks to everybody who came or who's going to be listening to this. And um, contact me if you 
are interested in learning more about mystery school, I'd love to share that too. And um, wonderful. All right. I'll thank be you. Uh, thank you, Rohini. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. you everybody for being here. It's so nice to see you. And I thank you, Lori, for inviting me. I feel very blessed to be able to share in this group.